right, welcome general chemistry students to lecture number five on density. We're gonna figure out who the densest element is. Gotta have some like fun little facts to come out of this one. All right, finish submitting. And we're gonna go through the other announcements in just a moment. I, let's just do this here. <clears throat> How many significant digits should the answer have in the following problem? Let's see what you guys pick. I heard a lot of heated debates over here. So here we go. And three, two, one, and zero. As long as you hit a number it, or a letter, it should I should be in here. I hope that's the case for you. Because this is how I'm recording that you are on time. The results. I have been doing this long enough that I can find a question that you actually, that shows you didn't actually learn the process, okay? But, and, and so it's good because then we want to make sure um, you know the process. Okay, so let's go through the process here. Now, some of you have correctly identified. So when you're doing addition, you have to keep track of decimal places. That's what I've been saying. That's what I said for many years. But the other way I say it is you have to keep track of if you're doing addition, you gotta keep track of position because sometimes there's no decimal places like in 9,700. Those oh, zero significant. They are not. Good job. And they would be if I had a decimal or a macro on there that I could declare them. So this is now only accurate. I have to keep track of the position. Position is the hundreds position. Now all of those other numbers like 525, the least accurate position, the first best guess, some people call it, is in the lines, and then it just gets more and more precise after that. So the answer, right? So the answer, though, we do need to round to the hundreds position. Means if it's 103, uh, no, 336, so that's 10,336.62, I have to. It to that position. Bring the rest of the stuff into zero, and if it was a five or greater than I, or greater than a five, then I round up. So that means that this number is 10,300. Sure, and I go, oh, how many significant digits do I have? And there are how many? Three. There's three. Nope. I'll, go, I'll go click it. That was right later on. I lost the deck. All right, so just so if you go back and look at the slides, and I'm showing a least significant position. The example that I showed before, it was easy for your brain to go, oh, I see two, the answer has two. And that was not the right process. When you're doing addition or subtraction, you have to look at the position and you have to look at the answer. You cannot look at the numbers you started from. You have to look at the answer. The answer to the question of how many significant digits is in the answer. Questions on that? Subtraction, because subtraction is just... Oh, oh class people. Yeah. Now, normally, so the sound is probably not going to be the greatest here. I'll try to stay in front of my microphone here. Uh, I got all sorts of port problems. I plug in a normal microphone and it just doesn't want to work. Way more. Announcements. Okay, we'll do a worship talk midway through. <clears throat> Your next homework assignment is in OWL. And that's due next Wednesday. This is on the schedule. Nothing new here. Nothing there. No lab on Monday because of why? As of labor, uh, many days. And so out of the generosity of our, no, we have nothing to do with it. National holiday, we all take it off. Nobody's here. You guys are welcome to come uh, and sit in the classroom if you want to just keep practicing. But don't, don't sleep in, uh, do you think? Okay, so our lecture one and three was due today. I think most of you guys got it done and it looked right. So that was great. Um, and there was a syllabus quiz that was due Learning Hub. And I reminded some of you earlier this morning, please go into, the, into Learning Hub and figure that out. And if that was one of you, there was just like five people. 
And um, so thank you for getting that figured out and getting that done. <clears throat> when something is due in learning, when, it's, when I say go in the learning hub, we're not working on that in class. That is for you to go work on uh, at your uh, leisure, which I know you don't have a lot of leisure time, but that's when you gotta go do it. Okay, don't forget, you have two items already due in the lab section of Learning Hub. There's a safety quiz. Think about half of the students, if you guys have figured that out. Uh, to get it done. General lab information. I put my PDFs that I showed in class, they're up there. Uh, they went there on that Monday, I got them up, I think Tuesday or Wednesday. And um, what else? Lab number two will be happening not this Monday, but the following Monday, I have turned on all of that information. There's some pre-lab materials, a pre-lab quiz. I'll be sending an email out about that, mainly because of what I'm going to talk about next. That okay? Dramatic entry. Ah, I have it all dramatic. Okay, here we go. I'm not here next week. I have debated long and hard about this, and. Um, my daughter is at a school where they take the seventh and eighth graders to the boundary waters and they like a parent to go with their kids so you can spend time with your kids on this. They pick Labor Day because they're around Labor Day, but I'm gone the whole And uh, this is in northern Minnesota and it's the boundary between the United States and Canada. And there are little to no uh, cell towers up there for uh, internet access. Oh, I will not hardly be even checking my email. I will try, but the people in my group, you can only have a group of nine people. Has anybody been to Boundary Waters? Oh. So I love canoeing, uh, and I and I love spending time with my daughter, my middle child. Get, uh, she and I get to go on this trip, and uh, we're going to uh, four days. Uh, we have one day to get up there, one day to get back. So that's two days. And then four days south canoe, and there's just thousands of lakes. So what's going to happen for you is every, or you don't have to come to class here next week. And I, I don't want to jump to this next slide. So there's no class because of Labor Day, and we're going to get through quite a bit of the density that you should be able to do most of your homework, but. To help you out, I'm actually going to go through each owl problem that's due on Wednesday and give you some hints and pointers and think about this and set it up. And then on uh, Wednesday, there will be a lecture video I would like you to watch. And there will be a learning hub quiz to say that you watched it. It'll be like five questions. Hey, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you watch the video? Yes. Boom. Easy five points. Okay. And then Thursday, I'll have another video that you can watch to help you with all the owl problems that are due on that Friday. So, hey, we can look at this one. I'm not doing it for you. I'm just showing you, hey, if you set it up this, you can plug in the numbers into this formula. Friday, there will be another video uh, in Chapter 2, and uh, you will watch that and do another learning hub quiz. I haven't completed those quizzes. I'm going to do that this afternoon. So, you won't have to come to class next week. You can sleep. That's your schedule, but please get them done. Um, I'll try to put some generous due dates on the uh, due times, but if it's a Wednesday video, I'd like you to get it done, watch the video and the learning up quiz on Wednesday. Maybe I'll make it like for Wednesday night and then Friday you know, afternoon or something. For, so I you to watch it. And uh, well, they got some of them made, they're not up there yet. And uh, I'll try to, I may have just put these right into YouTube so that they're already processed and they're easy to access and watch. And we don't have any problems, Stanton. <laughs> and when I put them up in the YouTube directly, that seems to work better. And then you can watch them at um, you know, different speeds. You guys ever watch videos at high speed? If you don't, you should try it. It's actually kind of like, oh, that guy's just yammering on, let's go one and a half speed. You know, and, and boom, you get class done in, in a lot less time. And you heard it just as well. I am going to have TEs uh, uh, talk to a few. They said, yeah, we can be available maybe for an hour or two on some of the days next week where you can get help from TAs if you're struggling. There's always student success. You guys remember how to get a hold of success? Student success? 
Yes. Sass at Andrews. I need you. And get a hold of them. That's where they came in and gave a presentation. And so it's nice people. And uh, there's uh, st students that have done very well last year and previous years. And they're the, they're the ones offering some group tutoring. Don't forget, OWL has a ton of help. And you get 14 attempts on each one, essentially. Um, so there's a lot of things there. If you are desperate and you need help on something, uh, I'll talk. I, Dr. Lando usually has been able to help. He's the chair, and he also has taught general chemistry for many years. Since COVID's been around, I've been doing both sections, but normally there was someone else doing the other section. Speaking of OWL and extensions, if you did not get something done, you get three extensions. What does that mean? Hey, man, I didn't get it done. You can email me, except for next week. Right? You can email me, and I'll, I'll do my best. There are sometimes I can get internet access out there, but I have to stand on one foot and it has to be on an island, um, you know, halfway in the water or something. But it did work a little bit, uh, I've heard, and I did experience. So uh, if you uh, send me an email, I'll give you a couple of days. Or if you, if you email me and say, Dr. Hayes, can I have a week to com complete our lecture five? And I'll say, great, no problem, it's in there. But if you don't tell me, you just want an extension, I'll give you two or three days. Two days, I usually respond pretty quick to those extension requests. Uh, you can ask any time for an extension throughout the semester, but it has to be during the semester. You can't go, hey, I have three extensions and I'll just do them over Christmas break. We're done with classes, grades are submitted, you can't do that. But anytime that you want to save your three extensions for the week before finals, great, you can do that, no problem. So you can get these extensions, you only get three of them, and you can use them anytime you want throughout the semester. And for any reason, you don't have to tell me unless you want to. My dog ate the, you know, my thumb drive and and because uh, it was shaped like a biscuit, and you know, so you but don't have to even explain, just say I'd like to use one of my extensions. No explanation needed. Remember, there's always, uh, you can always go back and the homework they just completed is now available to look at under the assignments I can practice now. Questions, comments? So we're essentially doing what a lot of universities do with the class next week. It's called a flipped classroom. A flipped classroom, has anybody experienced the flipped classroom before? I like the thing to do. I don't think it's the thing to do always, but okay. you make the students go watch videos, and when you come to class, you ask questions. The teacher doesn't say anything. Did you guys watch the video? Okay, no? Okay, too bad. You're supposed to watch the video. So uh, I don't do that, uh, but we're kind of doing, we do a little bit of that for the lab, and then next week it'll be kind of like that. It's not my preferred thing, but I wish they could do the trip some other time. So thank you for working with me and, and, and uh, allowing this wonderful activity. So let me know if you have any questions on that. Otherwise, we got to get into a really heavy topic for today, you guys. Super. Intensity. No questions, though? I'll be sending some. We're looking for emails. And uh, I'll be saying some things about lab and resources um, to get a hold of it. Have you guys been getting my emails when I sent some? I haven't sent too many out last week, but have you got emails from me before? I did post some stuff in Learning Hub, so I'll put an announcement in there. It hasn't been too much yet. We check in junk mail too. All right, density. The mass of an object divided by uh, the volume of that mass will give you an intrinsic property of the material called density. We use grams per milliliter. Grams is the mass, and volume is in milliliters. That's the most common one. So this is a heavy topic, but honestly, it's your destiny. In fact, uh, wait, no, not your destiny. Mass over volume. It's your density. I tried. That's in the morning. You get the deep Darth Vader voice. Yeah, I went over like a lead balloon. Speaking of density, <laughs> that doesn't go over, by the way. Lead balloons don't go over. Uh, the numbers, we'll be seeing some, so you can get familiar if you're not already. 
Water is about one gram per milliliter. It's not exactly one. It's pretty close to that at four degrees Celsius. But at room temperature, it's like 0 0.99, 937. There's, anyway, you will see a table in uh, lab number two dealing with that. So in order to figure out the density of material, what do we do? We take and we measure the mass of a substance. Let's say I want to find the density of the liquid inside of a Coca-Cola can. And so I know the volume. And uh, I teared out the, I figured out a way to not weigh the can. And, um, and so what I'm gonna show you is the, uh, some example numbers for the liquid uh, that's inside there. So we go and we measure the mass. And then we find a way to measure the volume. We could pour the uh, volume out or we could just go with the volume on the can there, 355. We have so many ways to figure out volumes of materials, especially the liquids, graduated cylinders, biometric glass, beeper, uh, beeper, beepers, beakers, and all sorts of things. Uh, we're just going to look here. Uh, we're, I'm going to teach you another uh, way with solids and one of our problems coming up. So we now have uh, the volume, 355 milliliters. How many significant digits? Three. The mass of the can from the balance, 384.2 grams. And so how many significant digits? Four. I can now do the calculation by plugging in those numbers. Put in the mass, 384.2 grams. Hit the divide by 355 uh, milliliters. And then I get one of these answers. Please get your clicker out. And which answer is the correct one for the density Pull, multiple choice, and yep. the answer yep. Yep. Much sliding. You guys can get good at sliding it out there. Uh, do, you, do you guys actually need the calculator for this problem? Well, why not? Well, all the same. What's, what's different about the answers? Where it's rounded, or in this class, we will just say the significant digits are different for each one. So you didn't need your calculator. I'm going to ask a significant digit question. And it looked like you can tell. I mean, feel free to do the calculation and go, ah. And then notice the density. That could be a like, that could be a density of the liquid. You put a lot of sugar and it increases the density of water by a little bit, like that. All right, let's see what you guys picked. In three, two, one, and zero. And that is correct. Very good, you guys. So this one's not too bad. Well, it's multiplication division. You look for the smallest significant digits, three fifty five. And then my answer better have three significant digits, and B is the right way there. All right. Speaking of cans of soda, it's time for a public service announcement dealing with soda. You see, I have one here actually uh, drank the plate. I found another one here. Uh, what have you heard that you shouldn't do with a can of soda? I mean, like this, right? That is a big no no. You should never shake a can, especially in front of a bunch of people or in a restaurant. That is not a good thing. Now, what have you heard that you can do to fix it? Tap it at the top. You guys heard anything else? Slowly spin it. Yeah, those are not the right way to do it. So, what's happening, I, uh, I've seen this with a baby bottle, and I haven't been able to find a good baby bottle to do this in. The carbon dioxide bubbles, when you shake it, the, they form bubbles and they stick to all the sides. Look it. It knocks the bubbles off up into the headspace. And I like to go around. Every time I say can of soda, I always think of this. And I probably a few, and I go around like this, and then I open it. Would anyone like this? I've got my own. Who likes squirt? Anybody? Pancreas needs a bunch of sugar. Go, <laughs> sir. 
Yes, pressure affects density. Temperature affects density. That's when we say some of these things, we're mainly dealing with room temperature. Yeah, that's, a, that's great. We can change the density of materials by changing the pressure that we put on them, for sure. All right, important point that I would like you guys to get out of here. Oh, by the way, I've done that, and I have given out like 40 cans to kids, and I'm like, all right, let's all do this together. And, um, and then the one kid who, he was so diligent. And then he, before we're getting ready to open it, and then he picks it up, and then he opens it. And, and now it's too late. And so we have a few failures. The, the current way that this works really well is when it's cold. Does it, it feel cold? Does it feel cold? Yeah, I had it in the refrigerator. And we're going to learn why that is. It's a Henry's Law uh, thing when we get to the gas chapters. So maybe we'll try again there. All right. So uh, another question again. I'm going to get into some problems here. Is density a measured or defined quantity? All right, and here we go. What do I mean by that? If it's something that is measured, then it is something that uh, has limited significant digits. If it's a definition, like, hey, a dozen uh, eggs is 12, then that's a definition that has an unlimited number of significant digits. So. When you see densities, what are you going to think? Measured or defined? And if you're not sure, you can look at all the other red words. The slide. Feel free to discuss it, though. You know, a lot of the words measured. But he gave me a definition. There's a definition of density. But is it defined and how we use that word? All right. So you guys got to debate that, and you only got a few more seconds. And three, let's go ahead and finish this up. Two, one, click in. Remember, you just got to click in. You don't you have to get it right. A or B. Sorry, no yeah, thank you. I know this leads into some of like, these uh, stimulating conversations. I just saw the question. Yeah, it's a great question. Three, two, one, and zero. Okay, there we go. And good, measure. It's measured if you measure the mass. And yes, there is a definition to it. it but it's defined to be two measurements and your ratio. Okay. Well, anytime you see density, it's always from a measurement that has limited significant digits. Do you guys know what the densest element on the planet is? And here is how I want you to answer it. I would like you to go look on the periodic table. Uh, let's pull this up. We're going to turn this into numeric. And please enter your guess at the atomic number, and that is the blue number. And, and look around, and maybe you think it's aluminum. Uh, AL, and if you think it's a little bit, type in 13. Type in a 1 and a 3, and then submit that as your answer. Uh, maybe you think it's uh, potassium. I would put the 19. So look up here on that front, periodic tables, and enter in the blue number. That's the atomic number. That's how many protons it has. And so, uh, what do you guys say? It's just a guess. It's, it's a guessing game. A little Jeopardy music in the background. Because the number of the element, the number that's in blue, as an example, if you wanted to pick Z, Zn, dark mode. Just gas, you guys, just gas, come on. Hit 10. So we can see some more responses. It looks dense. The great thing is, uh, after three, we're going to learn why uh, some elements are more dense than others. It has to do with the bond. Yeah. Do you want the atomic number or do you want the mass? I would like the number that's in blue. Okay. 
They're up there. Now, those are called the atomic numbers. Please do not give me the red number, that mass number. <laughs> yeah. So as an example, um, and maybe you want to pick sulfur. Then I please type in one six. Sixteen. Let's see what you guys pick. We, we, we spent a long time on this. I need to get on. It's just, it's just fun. We're just having some fun. See if you guys know. So, buddy, you can answer though. Okay, let's see what you guys pick. And three. Oh, you shouldn't be with us. We've had time, but this. I just want to see what you guys think. Three, two, one, and zero. And we have seven people who picked 76, and that is actually the correct answer. Anybody know what element 76 is? Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't get the love that some of these other elements do. You know, it's funny because uh, I don't know if anybody pays attention to comic books and superheroes and that stuff. They're, oh, in the past, uh, uh, Superman has this power. And uh, he can look through things except like, with his x ray vision, but except for he can't look through which element can he look through? Red. Red. Okay, we've got some other book fans out here. Anyway, it's a good trivia thing. And why can't he look through red? Because it's so dense, is why they can't look at it, look through it. Well, it turns out he can't look through uh, a bunch of other elements, and, and especially osmium, because it's so dense. Uh, we had 103, a few people picked that, and then a bunch of other ones here. And the other one that's actually really close, I'm going to see if I can see it in here, is uh, 75. Is there a 75? Oh, right there. Yay! That one's right up there. We'll give you that. Uh, but uh, the other ones, I'll show you some other numbers. 77. Uh, oh, wait, was it 77? <gasps> 77. Sorry, that was 77. I take this one. It's iridium is really close to osmium. There you go. All right, and so no worries if you didn't pick that. It's just we're having some fun here. I wanted you to think about it. And then when we see some other things, so osmium in iridium, uh, 22, almost 23 grams in one milliliter. Remember, water is one gram in one milliliter. So this is 23 times more dense than water. All right, so there they are right there. There is a reason why that part of the periodic table uh, is very dense. In fact, if you look at this column bar chart right here in the metals here in the transition metals, you will see that uh, um, it's pretty dense. Uh, H, that's HG. AU gold is pretty dense. Platinum, iridium, and osmium. These are very dense elements. They are very heavy. They are hard to move. Here are some other density numbers. Mercury, very 14.7, so it's nearly 14 times more dense than water. Lead stops x-rays and apparently is the most dense element known to man, and it's not. It's 11.3, and you can get lead fishing weights because they sink really well. Same at the hardware store. Uh, if you had uh, gold that was the same uh, volume as a cell phone, it would weigh two pounds for a thousand grams here, kilogram. Your little phone, you're like, oh, it's so light. If it was made out of gold, you'd be ah, two pounds. I could do two pounds. Yeah, but when you carry around two pounds all day long, that can get pretty heavy. In fact, uh, movies do such a terrible uh, uh, way of conveying the density of gold. And I have a little clip here. So we're going to watch uh, the Italian job when they're stealing gold. Let's see how they handle the gold. And I did. Just how they handle it. I don't know if you guys know it. Oh, they're like throwing it around. But at least they're sliding it. It gives you some semblance that they think that it's heavy. Uh, to really get a good view of how heavy it is, I found this video. There is a way, uh, this, I'd said some places where, I don't know, maybe like that. Because somebody's going to do this. If you can get the gold bar out of the hole, you get the gold bar. Oh, my 
It's very rare. Very rare. All right. So here are some other. Uh, so gold, nineteen point three. It's almost right up there with osmium. I mean, you look at other metals like silver. Uh, it's a lot less dense. That would be easy to take out. Copper, not not as dense. Iron, not as dense as you think. Uh, and then some other things that are not metals. You know, like the, the rocks and stuff around us are one or two, three, one to three uh, grams per milliliter or per centimeter. Have you guys seen this list of metals before? Where have you seen them? Have you guys a statue? Now we're doing a worship stuff. Uh, it's always baffled me that when you look at these metals, they're in order of a number of properties. One of those properties is density. When you're building something, you shouldn't put the most dense thing on top. That's, that's top heavy. It can fall over. That's not a great way to build something. But it's an order of density. It's also an order of hardness. The harder the metal that when you go down, gold is quite soft. Decreasing cost, they're cheaper as you go down. The heat capacity, the higher heat capacity as you go down. Gold has one of the lowest heat capacities. And there's other things, conductivity. And I didn't show this in class for many years. Man, there's gotta be a lesson in here somewhere. And there is. I went, Lord, please, I've looked at this for years. What's the lesson? He, God said, go back and read the story. So I went back and read the story. And Daniel is trying to save you know, all his friends. And he's implored. The king's asked us to uh, tell him his dream. I mean, who can do that? And explain it. And, uh, he, and the answer, and he goes to Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, all right, king. Uh, he explains the metals. And, uh, and then he's explaining uh, what's going on here to Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, you, king, okay? The king of has granted you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. Wherever humans live and wild animals, birds of the sky, he's given them under your power. He's given you the authority over them. You are the head of gold. And uh, then we can answer the question, like, wow, that's awesome. And uh, well, where is the message in this? What is, what is God trying to do this? And what does density have to do it? Have to do with this? And when I think about the density, I, you just don't build something with the greatest density on top. That just doesn't make sense. You wouldn't do that. Things that are dense, they sink down, they're top, top heavy. And then it, it was clear to me what was happening here. The message that maybe you guys are better at getting than I am, but the message is when you look at chemical properties, that's not what gives that material its, its intrinsic. It's what God has done. God put those things together in that order. Because naturally, they would go together in another way. Probably put gold at the bottom, you build it the other way. But when God has done something, there's that. And God puts things for a certain reason in the places that he does. And that's what the message was to Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, you thought you were king because you were great? Uh -huh. There's someone who is greater, and that's God. And he's the one that has been orchestrating uh, the, the events for you to be king. And God is doing that with you guys. You think you're here at Andrews because you had a great ACT score? Yeah, probably. Right? And SAT scores? That's for sure. But I know as I look back in my life, and I'm sure that you do, and when you look back, boy, God, thank you for helping me study for those tests. Uh, great parents, had a good food, and uh, you are so blessed. And it's God putting things together so that we're all here to sort of have this discussion. God has brought you to Andrews for reasons that we, you don't know yet. Oh, yeah. So I thank him for that. Let's pray. Father God, here we are, middle of class. Just want to stop and say thank you for these amazing materials, the properties. And then when we see how they work, but then we see you do something else, then we know that your hand is at work there. And so this is great. Thank you for bringing all these students to Andrews and that we could have these special moments together and recognize you as our God. I'm only here because of what you have done in my life and, and for blessing. So thank you. And we just uh, praise you for that. Bless us, uh, the rest of the class. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Big trend. Big trend in materials. Uh, materials normally, when they're in their gas phase, when they are uh, hot for relative to that, they have a density we'll call X. But as they condense down into a liquid, all the elements or the atoms of that element or what material come together, and the density is about 800 times more dense 
than it is in the gas phase. And you can see that with some gases here. As you freeze them, uh, they become a liquid. And if you freeze them some more, they become a solid. The solid is about 1,000 times more dense than the density. This is the normal behavior of materials. They would get more dense as you turn them, usually through cooling them down, into the liquid phase, into the solid phase. That is the normal property. Yeah. So we're talking about known densities. Are we talking, which phase are we talking about? Okay, so the question is, that's a great question. When we're talking about known densities, uh, it just depends. So most of the things on the periodic table uh, are solids at room temperature. And you can tell that quickly if they're black, if they're written in black letters, we're gonna go over this in more detail in chapter three. Um, if they're black, they're solids at room temperature. So those are gonna have the highest densities. You see all the black letters on there? Those are solids at room temperature. Do you guys see anything that's written in blue font? Mercury and, and bromine. Those are liquids at room temperature. So it's not random that some of those are black and blue and red. The red ones are gases at room temperature. Really, they have at room temperature um, densities that are very small. Here we got a couple of problems to get through, but there is one material that I think you guys are very familiar with that does not follow this trend. Does anybody know what material that is? As you go from the gas to liquid, it does get very, the density does go up, but as you go from the liquid to the solid, the density gets less instead. But turns out that property of water is abnormal. Is that water? That's not water. It looks like water. I found another clear liquid. I was able to freeze it, make little cubes of it, and dropped it into its liquid phase. And it sunk. This is T-butanol, tertiary butyl alcohol, or just T-butanol, some people call it. That is the normal property of materials. You live in a world where there is an abnormal chemical and we have lots of it. It's non-toxic, it has all these wonderful properties, and, uh, but that's normal. Well, that's why we come to this class and I can show you what is normal and what is not because we just live in a special planet where we have lots of liquid water. Having some talks later on where we get, and it'll be outside of class if you guys want to come, we can learn more about this stuff. Uh, but we're going to get on to a problem now and do some calculations. All right. Here's an example owl problem that you will encounter. And I already got worked out because I forgot to do the animation on this one. That's okay. What is the mass of a 49.6 milliliter sample of a liquid? So they give you a volume. And you are given, why don't you get it, width, which has a density of 0.85 grams per milliliter. So we can go back to the formula and go density is equal to mass over volume. Problem, and you see what they gave, what they give you. Oh, they gave me the volume, 49.6 milliliters. What else did they give you in the problem? Did they give you the mass? No. Did they give you density? Yeah, so we can plug that number in here, 0.85 grams per milliliter. This and this, and uh, this is great. So here we go. We can plug it in, 0.85 grams per milliliter, and that equals the mass, which we don't know. So we need an algebra. We can't find m's, but we can find x's. So just turn it into an x, and we can find m's. Uh, and 0.6 milliliters in here. And then what would I do to solve this problem, you guys? What is all this? Yes, I gotta get X by itself. So what would I do? Yeah. 0.6, right? On both sides. And then that then my uh, milliliters cancel out and that will turn into grams. And you'll get uh, 42 when you correct for the number of significant digits there. That is a great way. If that made sense to you, go for it. But I want to open your mind to another way of looking at other things that occur. And that's what I'm showing here on the screen on the PowerPoint slide. If you think about it for a few moments, 
density is actually a conversion factor. Well, what do you mean? Well, what density means in this situation, if I have 0.85 grams of that material, that is equal to one milliliter of that material. But no, it's, it's 0.85 grams per milliliter. That's what that means. That means one milliliter per one milliliter. Because when, when they don't say when it, that unit says per milliliter, that means per one milliliter. So I can always throw a one in there in front of that unit there. So remember from yesterday, if two things are equivalent, they are what? You can turn them into what? Conversion factor into a, a, a fraction. And then it becomes a conversion factor. And when do we use conversion factors? The first thing or the second thing? The second thing, right? Or the third or the fourth. So what did they give us in the problem? They gave you a volume, and your goal is to switch it into the mass. And so now it becomes another way of looking at density and another way of solving problems. I'm going to look at the unit that they gave me and the unit I'm trying to get to. Do I have a conversion factor that gets me from the volume of that material to the mass of that material? And that's where... I can use that, right? I can use this as a fraction in whatever way that I want, as long as it cancels out my unit. So I want to put the one milliliter on top and the 0.85 grams on the, and it's the same exact calculation as I did before, but I think about it in a conversion factor way, conversion factor second, that they gave me first, and I can get to my answer, two significant digits, 42 grams. So that is a more powerful way of thinking through these problems. Both, did we get the same answer? It's the same process, right? I end up going volume times the density, volume times the density. It gives me the same thing. But the thought process is actually, I think, a little bit more powerful. And it's connecting these ideas of units. And what, what, why we love this idea of density, because it connects volume to mass. A couple questions and one other problem before we go today. Hey, do you guys know what the definition or what one cubic centimeter is equal to? Let's see if you guys can uh, go the multiple choice. Let's take uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds or 40 seconds here. Is any guys going to get back out? Hold on. What does one cubic centimeter, one cube centimeter, we call it cubic centimeters. If you're in the car, we call it CCs. Yeah, I got four CCs. Uh, all right, uh, no, something else. So uh, what is that equal to? One nanoliter, one microliter, one milliliter, one liter, one kiloliter. Okay, if, you, if that's the only one you miss, um, you'll be fine. You can miss one. Okay, so let's go ahead and click in, you guys. Looks like most of us got there. Let's finish it up in three, two, one, and zero. Yeah, it's usually once a day. Hey, very good. C is correct. C is correct. One milliliter. In fact, uh, it is by definition one to one. So one centimeter is one milliliter. They're the same thing. So it is perfect. You don't lose any significant digits. So I, I could have rewritten this problem right up here, you guys, and called it one cubic centimeter. You need to see them as the same thing. There's no difference. It's just how do you want to write it, how to convey the material, okay? Same thing. There's no difference between them. So when you see one equals one, that's telling you it's the same thing. All right, one more problem before we go and to help you with your homework. And then, like I said, I'm going to post videos working through all the problems. Now, there's another way to get at the volume of a solid. Or, or so, yeah, usually, like, especially if an irregular solid. If it's a regular solid, like a sphere, we can use the standard sphere of a volume, pi d cubed over six. Come on, that's the very, actually, that's, I never looked at it that way until today. Is that the volume of a sphere? I thought it was, what's the volume of a sphere? Thirds pi r cubed. is four thirds pi r. What's D stand for? Uh, Diameter. How does that relate? 
The diameter is actually, uh, the radius is the diameter divided by two cubed. Solve that and you'll see where they got that formula. Oh, clever, I kind of like it, yeah. Okay, but okay. with that aside, so you can figure out the volume of an object by taking a rule out, you can measure it, do it in cubic centimeter, do it in centimeters. If you do all the measurements in centimeters, multiply them, you'll end up with cubic centimeters and that's milliliters. So that's why that's valuable. Or, you guys are going to do in lab a uh, week from this Monday is you're going to put a solid into some liquid and the solid will displace its volume. And so that's very nice. So we're going to do a problem with that very quickly. And so you look where the volume started and you look where it ends. This is one way to do it. We're going to do another way in class. And so here's a problem and then I'm going to turn you guys loose here. Mark. Look at this problem, a 105.5 gram sample, so there's my mass, and we're going to find the volume. It was placed in the graduated cylinder. The level started at uh, 25.4 milliliters and went to a final volume. So now I go here, 34.7, uh, this was the final, this is the initial volume. Just subtract the two, keep track of significant digits. Remember, I'm doing a uh, subtraction, so that's, um, I gotta use the addition rule. And so what's my answer for the volume here? 9.3. So now I have my volume, I can put 9.3 up here, and then I can get my number. Has anybody got a number for that? 0.34, but I only have two significant digits because of that over there. So unfortunately, I got to call it 11 grams per milliliter. And which metal was it? Those are a couple of the key problems that you will be working. I will, like I said, have a video where I work through all of them. And at this point, uh, since we found lead, you guys, you got to get the lead out. Which is a euphemism for see you later. <laughs> What's that? Yes. Threw me off when I saw it. I was like, oh, I want a good picture of volume displacement and geometries. And uh, I found this on Google Images this morning and I'm like, oh man. I'll see my notes and videos here and uh, as soon as I get back to my office. And I'm going to stop the video.